Yes. And President Clinton as well. Back to the stage. Thanks. So let me introduce everybody who is here. Monty Moran is the co-CEO of Chipotle Mexican Grill, one of the fastest expanding fast food business in the country, and my boy's absolute favorite, which is just the God's honest truth. All of our money goes to you. Uh, Darren Walker <laughs> is president of the Ford Foundation, a nonprofit working to promote social change and reduce poverty. Carly Fiorina, former CEO of Hewlett Packard and the first woman to lead a Fortune 20 company. She was a Republican Senate candidate in 2010 in California and is now Global Chair of Opportunity International. Sarah Horowitz, founder and executive director of the Freelancers Union, an organization that provides health insurance and support to the one third of Americans who are independent workers. And of course, President Clinton back with us who needs no uh, introduction. As I say, I, I'm interested in talking to all of you about some of the worries we have in this economy, about the future of the economy, particularly workers, and the role of government in being a partner in meeting some of these challenges. I wanted to start, though, we came across this picture, which I think might be a startling example of government overreach. We're going to put that on the screen for everybody to look at. <laughs> Now, Monty, this is at Chipotle, and uh, it's, it's an outrage. I mean, this by by all accounts, that's a foul, is it not? It's outrageous. Yeah, we just can't accept that. My boys would not do that. This is president way back. I mean, now you're you're like a model, but I mean, way back in the day when you used to go to McDonald's, you were never uh, guilty of an egregious act like that, were you? <laughs> I was trying to think if I always successfully avoided being photographed. <laughs> right. <laughs> Committing a greed. No, I used to go get the, I violated all the health department rules. I'd go get the fries right out of the. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the, here's the irony of that in case you blame the press. That was the White House photographer that took that picture. <laughs> it just goes to show you. All right. Well, again, welcome, welcome everybody. Um, Bonnie, let me come back and, and, and start with you. One of the big worries that we have about our workers today is whether they have an opportunity to move up the ladder. And yeah. one of the big areas in our politics that's controversial is whether they're earning a livable wage, whether the minimum wage should be increased. Why don't we start as, as an area of worry for workers, how you address it and how it should be addressed. Yeah, I mean, the first part of what you asked, um, I think, is, is more important than the second part, which is, do they have the ability to move up? You know, uh, where the minimum wage is is important, but I don't think it's as important as what you do when someone comes into the business, uh, you know, to work at your business. What, the question is, is the goal of whoever hires them, the business, to keep them at that wage, or is the idea that you're going to take that person and, and empower that person to take advantage of opportunities so that they can rise up and, and have positions of leadership, positions that make them feel better, positions that, where they can affect the lives of others. You know, and at Chipotle, you know, it's our philosophy that each person at Chipotle is gonna be rewarded based upon their ability to make the people around them better, not just uh, how, how they themselves perform. And so when you have a system like that, what happens is everyone's invested in the success of other people, and so we have a, a system where 98% of our managers come from crew, and we had 9,000 promotions to management positions last year alone from entry-level positions. We don't have a widespread Carly Fiorina agreement about that, and certainly there's disagreement about whether the government should raise the minimum wage. But is it not a widely held view that uh, anybody working hard should be able to take care of their family, should have adequate child care so that they don't risk their job by taking care of a sick child and so forth? Do we have to have a livable wage in America? Of course, and the philosophy that Monty described is actually the same philosophy that holds at McDonald's and Burger King and some other uh, great American companies. I think there's no question that if you're making minimum wage, you think you want to make more. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the sad truth is that raising the minimum wage will hurt those who are looking for entry-level jobs. It hurts women who are frequently last hired and first fired. It hurts African-American youth who have very high unemployment rates. So the question is, are we creating an economy where people have the opportunity to get a job and rise? And I think the data is pretty clear. 
There's way too much crony capitalism in our economy today, which helps big business. And by we'll the get, way, let me we'll just say, that. both parties have participated right. in this. And not enough Main Street entrepreneurialism, which creates these jobs and which this initiative Let me just get some different perspectives on the minimum wage issue, Mr. President. Yeah, I, 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 did, I think it depend, you could have it so high that it would discourage employment. But, you know, when we raised it when I was president, the minimum wage in real dollar terms was at a 40-year low, and the labor markets were tight, and it wasn't oppressive, and it contributed to economic growth because you had more people working, they had more spending money, they circulated it at the bottom of the pyramid, and I, I think it added to employment. I think there's a lot of data on this now that indicates that if you get a minimum wage much above the median, much above 50% of the median wage, then it could have a depressing impact on employment. And if it's at 50% of the median or a little less, it probably won't. And that's what they're, at least that's all the research I've been able to find. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. So I think it should be raised because I don't think that, and I think all consumers should be prepared to pay for it because I think if somebody works full time and they have kids, they ought to be, out of, they ought to be able to raise their kids mm -hmm. without being in poverty. So, so I, I, but I, it just depends on how high it is, whether it's a depressant on employment. Right. Sarah, from an independent worker standpoint, whether it's health care, whether it's a livable wage, what do you worry most about? Well, you know, I think the way that we really measure this is a term that we call meaningful independence. That is, you need to be able to work in this new era that we're in where freelancing is the new norm, and you need to be able to have health insurance and retirement and all those things that really enable people to be great entrepreneurs. And I think that that matters whether you are a minimum wage worker or a well-paid executive. And I think that we have to change the frame to say, how can we be meaningfully independent? Because that's the only way that we're going to see an economy that's sustainable. Darren, I want to ask you and Monty as well. There's a lot of frustration. I mean, part of what we, you know, where there's a lot of worry about the workers, there's also a lot of frustration about workers. And this bleeds into our politics where they look up and they see you making $24 million a year. They see such concentration of wealth at the top and they don't feel as much opportunity. Well, I think we're dancing around the core issue in this country, and that is growing inequality. Mm -hmm. And regrettably, the situation with income inequality reminds me of the situation with climate change. And that is when the data began to demonstrate clearly the evidence. We saw a community of deniers emerge to distract us from a conversation around solutions. The broader context in this country today and why these issues are so contested is because the very idea of inequality is so problematic for public discourse in this country. But at the core of the American dream, our narrative is the idea of social mobility, right. and inequality robs this country But the question is, who's, who's supposed to be responsible for closing that gap that's occurring for a lot of reasons? I think the political divide gets to, well, government's got to somehow do something to close that gap. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, government can, but I think the most important thing is for CEOs, executives, to understand that there's an enormous talent pool at entry-level positions, enormous talent of people who aren't particularly educated and who also aren't particularly uh, you know, experienced. And those people, even though they're not educated, even though they're not experienced, have extraordinary character. And at Chipotle, we go out and we try to find people who have that character, bring them in at entry-level positions, and very quickly move them up through the ranks to be in positions of leadership. And that's why I say that we had 9,000 promotions to management positions, but we had four last year promotions to executive team director positions. And these are people who make extraordinary amounts of money, but also oversee over as many as 5,000 people each. And each of them, having come through the ranks, wants to deliver that same opportunity to everyone who's coming and it's, very, and it's a virtuous cycle. Carly, is CEO pay something that is hurting morale in a lot of companies if they see such a disconnect? I, I think CEO pay has to be based upon the results the company produces and absolutely transparent to shareholders. But may I just say I could not disagree more with my client. It is true. The rich are getting richer. The poor are getting poorer. The middle class are getting stuck in the middle. And that is because we have too much crony capitalism in this country proffered by establishment politicians of both parties, by the way. Not enough Main Street entrepreneurialism, but it is also true that the policies of this administration have made the rich much richer, 
Federal Reserve prints money, and the only class that earns a return in the economy is equity. So people who own equity, either in their home or in the stock market, get richer. People who don't own equity get poorer. We have more Americans living in poverty. It doesn't help lift someone out of poverty to put them on food stamps. What lifts someone out of poverty is a job and relief. But and I, there but are fewer Main Street entrepreneurs succeeding today. Brookings Institute came out with a uh, study. We are destroying more businesses than we are creating in this country for the first time in our history. We have fewer small businesses starting, more failing. The woman who wants to open a beauty salon in her home, the taqueria, okay. the lawn services company, these are the kinds of small businesses that create jobs. They're independent entrepreneurs. So, so can I just say, for sure, you know, we are living in a freelance nation. And the best way to understand this and why, to me, it's so hopeful and exciting is that I think we have the best example of a freelancer on this panel. In fact, we have the freelancer in chief right here. <laughs> this is somebody who left the most amazing government job to pursue meaningful things entrepreneurially has created this wonderful organization, yeah. has time to think and write, spend time with his wonderful family to show us that this is something that has to be a role model for all of us, that we can start leading these lives. So many of us feel like there's a great speed up for a lot of these economic reasons, and the speed up is not letting single moms stay and have some meals with their kids, read to their children, the husbands and wives, the partners of, of, of across the country. We're starting to see that people don't have this time. Think about the audience, think about us here, people watching. How many of us feel like we're leading sustainable lives? We feel like we're on hamsters on a little treadmill going so quickly, and honestly, we say, is this sustainable? Are we able to stop and have a meal like civilized people? And this is happening across the country, everywhere, and we need to start to say, what policies will be in place? What's the role of government that's going to let us see to the next economy where we can start so let me feeling ask like this. it's about us? President Clinton, just what we've introduced here, because you've written about this, you wrote about it in a book last year. What role does government play in trying to close that gap between rich and poor at a time of such limited social mobility? Well, first of all, I, let me back up and say, I don't think government can do this alone because it's a private economy. And the one thing I think the conservatives are often right about halfway is that, <laughs> cult, I'll tell you what I mean, is that culture really matters. And if you don't have a good culture in a workplace, if you don't have somebody committed to giving people a chance at mobility, if you don't have somebody committed to sharing the gains of the company in a fair way, uh, the government can't fix all that. I do believe you need a, a proper child development. You need a strategy to keep kids out of poverty. You need a strategy to prepare them. I think that, I think that given the transition we're going through in health care, the fact that we are spending 18% almost of GDP on health care and only giving health care to somewhere between 82 and 84% of our people through insurance, and all these companies, countries we're competing with who have achieved more social mobility and higher median incomes than we have and, can, and have weathered the financial crisis better than we do, spend somewhere between 9.5% and 11.8% of GDP. In other words, we're spotting them a trillion dollars a year that we would save for reinvestment. Uh, government matters. You have to have good efficient systems that are, are concentrated on human development. You have to have competitive financing systems. And you have to have investment that cannot be made privately, for example, in major infrastructure projects, including 21st century infrastructure, like universal access to broadband. Culture matters. I recommend all of you, just to prove what I'm saying, though, so we don't get too carried away here. Read my favorite management book written in 1997 called Plain Talk by the conservative Republican who started Nucor Steel. Wages as a percentage of corporate revenues are at more than a 50-year low. Ken Iverson started Nucor Steel in 
built it into the third biggest steel company in America without an office building. They rented space in an office park. He had 22 people in the central office occupying 12,000 square feet and four management layers, and every employee in the company had the number of the president and the chairman, but couldn't talk to them unless they talked to the other two people above them first. They earned 65% of the industry wage, but they got weekly production bonuses that gave them incomes of 130 to 200% of the industry average. They all got education supplements for their kids and eventually for their spouses and themselves, which they still do. And they had a no layoff policy so that everybody took a hit if they earned less money this year than last year. So that was I, culture. I, he was a conservative Republican. He didn't want the government doing it. But we have gotten to the point now where the shareholders matter, even activist shareholders that demand companies like Dow Chemical sell profitable divisions to give them their money this year, and nobody cares about Darren, get the it, workers. Get, go ahead, it's Darren. I just, well, I just would like to, to be clear that while I applaud the idea of of low wage jobs for young people as an entry point into the marketplace, that is not the basis of the American economy in the future. I agree. Or at least I hope it is not. I agree. We must focus on higher level jobs, higher skilled jobs, higher wage jobs. And that means we must invest in the American worker. So how does that happen? A how do we, we get to, more nimble, yes. Carly? Because and that, we have to invest in those industries and those um, employers that will provide higher paying jobs. So for example, energy is an industry that provides higher paying work and yet we are crushing energy in this country because of policies. I'm not a global warming denier, I just read the whole sentence. And the whole sentence says, the scientists say, that a single nation acting alone can have no impact at all. So are we going to sacrifice other people's lives and livelihoods at the altar of ideology? No, we should work Or are we going to be practical and say, and let's, you know, other, but who's doing polluters. that? No, no, you think we China's... We have the capacity as the yes, United States Yes, we do, States but we're not do doing, but we're not doing it. Okay. We're not doing it. We're crushing coal production in West Virginia, which will have no impact on global warming at all, except say, wait, yeah, that ahead. we are crushing ahead. communities. Ahead. Wait a minute. By the way, culture matters in government too, and it's a big... <laughs> Big unaccountable sure bureaucracy. Did. And who had the smallest government workforce since Eisenhower? Me. I That's right. That. You declared the era yeah, of big we, government over. But yeah, but not. I didn't declare the era of weak government that had nobody at home at the SEC before the financial crisis. I agree with that too. I agree with that too. So, let me. Let me just say something about all this stuff. It's, it's it. I do agree I, with the president. I, I, if we are trying to crush energy, we are doing a poor job of it. The unemployment rate in North Dakota is 3.6 percent. Well, look at New York. And Texas is doing oil and gas, but they also generate, on a good day, 25 percent of their electricity from wind. In other words, people that live in the... We need to live in the real world here. We, that people are scared of fracking, Carly, who live in states that have never dealt with it. I was governor of a state with a lot of natural gas, but you can sure have a lot of methane releases and a lot of pollution of that land around if you don't do it right. I mean, I, don't, I think we need to, you know, not get carried away here. We need, we, need a, we need to figure out practically what we have to do to work together on this. We don't, we need to describe the world as it is. People, if you, if you live in a place and you were worried about the water table and you'd heard all these stories about the gas wells getting on fire and you'd never, regulated gas, you'd be scared of it too. We can do this. A absolutely, and some level of regulation is absolutely required. It's gone too far in too many industries, so it's become crony capitalism where big companies profit and small companies get crushed. I mean, you're right about the SEC, but look at what's happened with Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank took 10 banks too big to fail, made them five banks too big to fail with record bonuses being paid all around. And meanwhile, community banking is slowly closing up shop as you demonstrated in your opening remarks. And guess what? Community banks loan to small businesses and entrepreneurs and community banks had nothing to do with the financial crisis. So let me, let me crisis. do this. I, I want to end on, on more of a forward looking point. I'm going to go around the panel here before we take a few of your questions. Monty. Bottom line, one thing we need to do to take a positive step toward dealing with this kind of income inequality that's really affecting workers. Understand how talented the group of people is. 
in the United States who don't have education and who don't have much experience, and also the immigrant population, understand how talented they are and that they have characteristics that you can't train, but they have these fundamental characteristics that will allow them to be incredibly powerful future workers in our country if we only empower them. And the way you empower them is you, is you, is you make sure that they're confident in their ability and encouraged by their circumstances such that they feel motivated and at liberty to devote their talents to a purpose, whatever that purpose be, whether it be right. Chipotle or wherever else they work. But if you give people a, a, a forum to go in and actually be believed in and to be at their best, what happens is they get better, they succeed, they get educated, and, and private businesses can pr play an enormous role so, in raising up the average standard of living of those people and also making believers out of all their family and friends so they can do it too. Sarah, on, in the lightning round concept of this. How are we nimble enough then to take a positive step to give workers a new orientation for more security? I think we have to realize that the era of big work is over and that people are going to be working project to project, job to job, and that is inherently nimble. But we have to imagine this in the context of the future where the question that we ask ourselves is, is this enabling people to be meaningfully independent? We are a country that loves independence Let's give people the tools and have a government that recognizes it's its job to start seeding the organizations that promote this and that the social sector has such an important role to play and that we not just focus only on business. It's all of us coming together. Darren. Ronald Reagan reminded us that the best investment we could make is in infrastructure. We desperately need a massive investment in infrastructure in this country. It creates, it creates good jobs, sustainable jobs, and it provides hope, which is at the core of the American narrative. We need hope and optimism. The one prescription, Carly, for dealing with this kind of income inequality. Encourage Main Street entrepreneurialism. At Opportunity International, we've loaned out $6 billion, $150 at a time, and have created 10 million jobs. 93% of our clients are women. Why do I tell that story? Because entrepreneurialism is almost a natural human instinct, but it has to be encouraged. Seed capital, support, tools, energy, all of the initiatives that the Clinton Global Initiative invests in to try and build Main Street entrepreneurship, it has always been the hope of this country. It is still the hope of this country. And everything that goes on in Washington, complicated tax codes, complicated regulatory structures, they help big business, but they crush little business. Final thought on this before we take a question. We should help self-employed people and small businesses to develop creative options like what Sarah does to solve things that big companies in the 50s used to do for their workers. Mm. We should have the government focus on infrastructure, R&D, and preparing people. And we should find a way to incentivize companies to do what Chipotle does, to create a culture of shared prosperity and genuine upward mobility. You have to have tighter labor markets and a different job mix to lift median income, but you also have to have a culture that really values the workers more. And, and that, I think it's really important. We have, there's almost no creative thinking doing, going on here at the national level about how we Instead of, the government can't regulate all this. You, you can't make people do the right thing. But if somebody is doing something that's really empowering people, we should think about how it can be rewarded and incentivized. And apparently, you have to raise that sneeze guard to keep somebody's <laughs> from reaching in we'll, to we'll try get right to get that, that, yeah. that extra hot salsa, which apparently you is know, a problem. <laughs> yeah, he didn't make it. My arms are longer. I would. <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you just grabbed the food straight away, right? <laughs> Presidential well, privilege. <laughs> Let's take questions. Uh, the, the mayor of the great city of Denver, Michael Hancock, is with us. Mr. Mayor, your question. Good morning and welcome to the Mile High City. We're glad to have CGI, CGI America here. I want to take you back to one of the more basic issues that you've all been talking about, kind of on the surface, but let's get a little deeper. Uh, having just returned from the U.S. Conference of Mayors meeting in Dallas, mayors agree that the greatest threat to the economic vitality of this nation is the achievement gap. And if we're going to keep America strong, we need to not only close but eliminate that achievement gap. And I'm wondering what you all think about how we turn the attention of this nation to measuring our future, our economic vitality, and of course the hopes of America by focusing on what Secretary Clinton talked about this morning, what the President briefly talked about here today uh, on this panel, how we focus on developing the youngest of all of us, our low income, our minority children, uh, and make sure that parents know how to help develop their brains, but focus on child development as a top priority of this nation. 
Who you wants know, to start? Go ahead, Greg. One of the things that we know about this great nation is we became great because more people could fulfill their potential here than anywhere else. It didn't matter where you came from or what you looked like or what your last name was here. People could fulfill their potential. And the fact that it's harder and harder for too many to fulfill their potential is at the core of our problems. Absolutely right. I was really encouraged the other day to see the case in Los Angeles where a judge sided with parents and children who were suing their school district to say, let us have a good teacher. There's nothing more important in childhood development, as Secretary Clinton was saying, there's nothing more important than a parent or a teacher encouraging a young person. We will never compete with China unless we unlock the potential of every single but we American. Also have and that starts with parents and teachers. Right, Absolutely. but we also have incredible amounts of political debate, Darren, around uh, whether to raise standards, how to raise standards, not to figure out how to execute on higher standards. So I was in the first class of Head Start in 1965, and, <laughs> and for me, this is a really important question because, because uh, my friend Carly said that this was always a country where you could come and your potential would be fulfilled if you worked hard and played by the rules. I said it was more possible for more it, people, which is it true. It was more possible for more people, but regrettably, there were many people left out. I agree. And there were many people who, because of their race, their background, I agree. Were, not, were not a part I agree. of that. And that legacy remains with us today. <laughs> and I agree. What I, and what I would say, therefore, is we need to continue to redress that legacy in our education I agree system. with that, too. And, the question is and how. And in order to do that, we need to focus on the communities that need assistance most. And what we find often is that, in a distorted way, the communities that need resources most are the least able to receive and, and are on the receiving end. And so I would just simply say, let's focus on where the challenges are, invest and invest heavily in those communities, and we will see results. All right, we'll get we have. Let's get one comment. Yeah, I you agree. know, I, I'm, Thank you for your question. And you know, I've been struggling to, to think about how, how we answer this here. And I think that there's a, a, a really profound point, which is that the role of government is to start supporting the organizations like okay. First Book and others that are doing amazing things by supporting them with resources, capital. You know, just today we're announcing that we're starting a national benefits platform so that any independent worker anywhere in America can get health and retirement and anything that we need. The fact is, there are so many groups across the country that are doing these amazing things and need the support that we've seen from political leaders to shine the light. You know in Denver the best organizations that if you could triple and quintuple and however you say it for times 10, that you, they would start to really solve things. And if we could do that in this country, instead of saying government's going to do it, it's not going to do it. And it's not going to do it because we have so much infighting in DC. So forget about the city of cannot doism, and let's work with mayors and local people mm -hmm. all over and start building it and say to government, now's the let time me, to help us. Let me, get, let me get to another question. Randy Weingarten is here, the president of the American Federation of Teachers. Hi, Randy, go ahead. Thank you, David. And, and look, we are a proud sponsor of, the, of what Sarah is doing with the National Benefit um, uh, Initiative and with First Book and on all the work on infrastructure. And we'd love to talk about how we create skills and knowledge from birth through um, all sorts of learning. So we'd love to work with all of you on that. This is my question. Our members' retirement plans, which they contribute to with every paycheck, represent a social promise that they'll be able to live in financial dignity when they finish working. We want to ensure that all Americans have that promise of a secure retirement. And before anybody says that this is a pipe dream, there are other Western democracies, even in this era, that have successfully tackled this challenge. I recently visited Australia, where the retirement system is run jointly by employers and unions and covers 95% of the population. Employees can take their retirement plans from job to job. It's portable. Employers contribute 9.25% of workers' wages into a professionally managed pooled retirement fund. So my question is, 
given that our retirement landscape in the United States is so different, including the fact that the Federal Reserve has said that the median retirement savings for working age households is about $3,000. And for those close to retirement, it's $12,000. How do we come together as a country to tackle this growing crisis of retirement insecurity? All right, we'll take one response on that. Mr. President, do you want to tackle that? Well, I think, first of all, I think we actually should look at it. I, 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 you didn't go quite where I thought you were going with it. I like the Australian system. But to be fair, they, they didn't make the political mistakes that we've made in a lot of our retirement systems where promises were made based on both demographic and investment return assumptions that were frankly not realistic. They got people over uh, a given negotiation or a given political crisis. Because the Australians did it nationally and had everybody represented, they could basically stay with the economics. And if there's some way we could effect some sort of change that would in, that basically would say, because you know, Social Security is the most successful anti-poverty program we have except for jobs. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But almost all seniors, well, 40-some percent of our seniors are kept out of poverty because of Social Security. They have some other source of income, too. So this is a really big deal. And it, there are lots of technical details here. If you wanted to go to a system like that, you'd have to roll out of a lot of the ones we've got. I do believe that the implication that we had to go everywhere from defined benefit to defined contribution plans, not all those plans were in trouble. And a lot of them were just a desire to divert some investment away from investment in the future to investment today. So there's enough blame to go around here, and I don't want to get into the blame game. We, I, I think the best thing would be to have some sort of national commission to look at something that would control both the investment and the benefit side so we wouldn't get in the mess that some of, you know, like we're facing in Detroit and and they're dealing with in Chicago today and all this. You just can't make people promises that given what you know about populations and returns, you're not going to be able to keep. But on the other hand, it's wrong to take their investment away so somebody can get a higher return for themselves in the short run. So we can work through all this. We need to do it in an open, transparent, and fairly non-political way. We are going to take a break here, and we're going to come right back. 